Pray with me. Gracious Father, you are the source of every good and perfect gift. You are the source of truth and right. We ask that by your Spirit, you will dwell within us. By your Spirit, let us dwell in you. Pour out on us the quiet purity to hear, the calm purity to understand, and the strong purity to act according to your most holy word. Through, your, through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning is found in Genesis, the 12th chapter, the first nine verses. You're now the word of God. The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all, the, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his, pitched his tent, with Bethel on, his, on the west and Ai on his east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. When we start thinking about redemptive history, for many years I always believed that the call of Abram was the beginning of redemptive history. Now the more I've studied, the more I've prayed, and the more I understand it really has been since the fall is the start of redemptive history. Before the fall, everybody was redeemed. Amen? Okay. And so from that point on, God has been at work trying to reconcile and redeem us and to fix and put back together that which is broken. Redeeming. Putting back together. Making it right. Righteousness. That's important for us to understand. And many years ago, and I said this earlier at the first service, and I'll say it again. Back in the early 90s, I took Disciple One Bible study. Many of you probably did. This was back during the time when they had VHS tapes. Now, many people in here have never heard of VHS there are some that have not heard of DVDs. So we're talking way back. But there were VHS tapes. And one of the presenters of that first disciple class was Dr. Albert Outler. And Dr. Outler was the person who came up with the terminology Wesleyan quadrilateral. Y'all remember that phrase? Scripture, tradition, uh, experience, and reason. He came up with that. But in the, this disciple class, he made the comment that God is about covenant making and covenant keeping, and humanity is about covenant making and covenant breaking. And that's the way it's been since the fall. And so in the midst of this conversation, if you want to think about redemptive history, we had the fall, and not long after the fall, if we're reading in Genesis, Cain killed his brother Abel. Remember that? And then after that, God blessed the next youngest son, which was Seth. And Seth, in the line of Seth, was a bless, blessed all the way to Noah. And the world got so bad that God flooded the world, right? Right? Remember that? 
after the flood, Ham, then he did something he shouldn't have done with his father. And he was cursed. He was the start of Canaan. But God and Ab- well Noah blessed Shem. Nine generations later, guess who comes about? Abram is the ninth generation, or tenth generation from, from Shem. And God calls Abram to go to Canaan. He was called and called to be blessed, to be a blessing. Those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. Blessed to be a blessing. Not blessed for favor, not blessed for anything, but to be a blessing to those people where you go. He's called. This past week in our staff meeting, I read a devotional from uh, this devotional book that's put out by the upper room. It's called Disciplines, and it's based upon the lectionary. And so every week there are four different scriptures they use, and I read this. And the author of that day made the statement, said, how many of you could do what Abram did? 75 years of age, taking everything, calling Mayflower movers, two men in a truck, I'm moving from basically Iraq to Judah, to Canaan. That's a long way. Many of us don't want to walk across the street at 75. How do we do what we do? How do we we know when we're called to do something that God is calling us? Because in the Bible, it never refers to God ever speaking to Abram before this moment. At 75, he finally hears God calling. The call. Understanding the call of God on our lives sometimes is hard. Uh, Many years ago, I, I read a book by Henry Blackaby called Experiencing God. And the The crux of that book says that if we want to understand what God's calling us to do, we look around and see where God's at work and join him. Join in what God is already doing. That's a good place to start. But he, I heard him preach, and he was talking about he had a four-point sermon that he preached everywhere he would go to do a revival or something. It was about the four points to understanding the call of God in our life. And he said he had had a lot of people tell him how good that sermon was. And then one day, the Baptist Mission Group of Florida calls him up out of clear nowhere and says, we want you to move to Florida and be a part of the home mission board who will plant churches all over Florida. And he says, I'll pray about it. And he prayed. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he didn't hear anything. And he gave up on his four-point sermon and went into his office and shredded it. Sometimes it's hard to know if God is calling us to something or not. We know that we're supposed to test the spirits. It talks about that in 1 John 4. Test the spirits. But be ready to go. The call. Y'all have heard this story, but I'm going to tell it again because I like telling it. Everybody needs to hear this more than once. Back in 1989 and 90, I began to walk with a widow, 13 years older than me. Her husband had died a month or so later, earlier, and we started walking down the road. And after you walk probably five nights a week, 2.6 miles 
in all kinds of weather and all kinds of conversations, you learn a lot about someone. And on that, in those walks, I learned that I did not have what she had. And what she had, I wanted. She didn't preach. She didn't do anything. She shared her faith just telling stories, talking back and forth. In a way, I believe God planted her in my life, really a long time before then. And so that's when I started taking God's call on all of our lives more seriously and began to read my Bible. And then through another incident, I began praying, and I began to understand God was doing something in my life. Fast forward to 1994. I'm sensing somehow that God's calling me to something I go on the walk to Emmaus, and I'm in one of those times of quiet, contemplative moments, and I sense God's call to ministry. I get home from that, and I go speak to my preacher about, I think I'm being called to ministry, and he says, I can see that. He didn't, the relief. When you sell, go into your preacher's office and say, I think God has called me to ministry, the fear is that he's going to laugh you out of the office. And he didn't. And then he asked me if I had told my wife. And I said I hadn't got the nerve. So a month later, I got the nerve. Now, this is the truth as I remember it. So I told June that, I was sensing call to ministry, and she said, I can see that, but, and this is a big but, if God had wanted me to be a preacher's wife, I would have married a preacher. About a month earlier, something went on in our life, and I asked her, may I pray about this situation for you. And she said, I would prefer that you not pray that for me. So when she said, I'd have married a preacher, I asked sheepishly, may I pray that God will give you a peace about it? And she said, I guess so. Y'all know the story of Gideon in the book of Judges? God calls him to do something. And he says, God, I want to be, I want to be obedient, but if you're really call, calling me, I'm going to throw this fleece out on the grass, and tomorrow morning when I wake up, I want the grass to be dry and I want the fleece to be wet. And the next morning, he wrung dew and water out of the fleece. And then he said, let's try two out of three. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I want the grass wet and the fleece dry. And that's what he woke up. I fleeced God for a while. But in the process of trying to figure out my, if I was being called or not, I, got, I immersed myself in the church. I taught confirmation. I was teaching, which was a sixth grade Sunday school class. I was teaching adult Sunday school class. I was doing a Bible study. I was on the council of ministries. I was a stewardship chair. If I, that's what I was doing. And I was doing everything and praying that my wife would have a peace about going into ministry. And then the fall of 1997, I was teaching disciple Bible study, and there's a passage in 1 Samuel where God is talking to Saul, King Saul, and says, you need to go wipe out these people. Destroy them. Everything they have, their animals, their jewelry, anything they have, destroy them. And I will give you the battle. And God gave him the battle. Saul said, hmm, those sheep look pretty good. I might can use some of those. This jewelry looks pretty good. I'm going to save some of that. I'm, I'm, 
And then Samuel goes to visit Saul, and it looked like Saul had just won the national championship in football. Y'all remember how it looked after Georgia won? All, just think of it that way. they having a good time. And he sees sheep. And he goes up to Saul and says, what are you doing, Saul? He said, we're celebrating the victory God gave us. And he said, well, what is the bleeding of sheep that I hear? He said, that's our sacrifice to the Lord. And Samuel says to Saul, God does not want your sacrifice. He wants you to be obedient. And in that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit telling me that all the junk I had been doing for the last three years, or a lot of it, was sacrificing to the Lord instead of trying to be obedient. And so I started praying harder. And about two weeks later or so, I was praying and reading my Bible, and this thought came to mind, be a part-time local pastor, bivocational. So I got up from my chair, and I walked back to our bedroom where my wife was reading her Bible and drinking the coffee I had fixed for her about an hour earlier while she was asleep. And I said, what about be a bivocational pastor, part-time local pastor, still be able to work? And she was looking up at me, and she looked down and looked back up and said, I can deal with that. And the rest is history. Answering the call is unbelievable. Does God call everybody into ministry? No. But God calls us all. He really does. Do you realize the reason you're sitting here is because somebody or a group of people all through your life answered the call of God on their life? I'm here because of a lot of people. And y'all are here because of a lot of people. You might be answering the call on your life because God has got a call on your life right now. Maybe you didn't grow up in the church. Maybe you were never raised in the church. Maybe you have never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit is drawing you and by his provenient grace to a relationship with him. But for the vast majority of us, we're here because someone else answered the call to love you, to care for you, to do what God has called and commanded us all to do. To love one another. To share the good news of Jesus Christ. To understand the truth of John 16 in our own life. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life. The idea that we answer the call so other people will know what everlasting life is all about. God called Abram, and we don't know that he ever spoke to him before. Jesus calls. In Matthew 4, we hear about Jesus calling Matthew and his brother Andrew. Jesus is walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and they're casting their nets into the water. And Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And he goes a little bit further, and there's James and John, sons of Zebedee, mending nets in their boat. And Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. My New Testament professor in seminary, Lord Melton, he used to say, when Jesus invited them to follow him, the kingdom of God broke into their life and the bondage that held them was broken. And they received and experienced the kingdom of God in their life. That's what happens when we answer the call to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And we can be set free from the things that entangle us, that hold us back. We can begin to love like Jesus loved. Love like God loves us. I don't know if God's going to call us all to go to the Ur, the Chaldees, from there to Canaan. 
but I think he's calling us all to make a difference. I really truly believe this, and I believe that this for 25 plus years. Every gift and grace and talent that is needed to reach this community for, of faith and the outside community, every talent is in this room in the membership of this church. And if there's something that we are lacking, God will get it to us if we only go about using our gifts and graces to answer the call he already has on our life. Jesus is calling us to make a difference. He's calling us to go and make disciples for Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. The question is, are we going to answer the call? I pray that we do. I pray that we do, and people will experience the freedom, the freedom of the kingdom of God in their life. Let us pray. Lord God, sometimes you need to speak more loudly. Sometimes you might need to get our attention. We pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would work in each person here to answer the call that you placed on us to go. May we see, may we experience that power. May we experience that love. May we be willing to share that love with everyone. Till everyone knows you and everyone has professed your lordship. We ask this in your son's holy name. Amen.